tradition this day and age to read any good news on the newspaper page. And love and tradition of the grand design, some people say, is even harder to find. All right, here we are, another episode unlocking Silicon Valley. It's good to be back. Yeah, it's good to be here. Uh, Dave's happy. I'm always happy. Except last episode. <laughs> He's happy, Dave. Yeah. What'd you bring? What did I bring? Mm-hmm. I brought you guys here today <laughs> so we can talk about real estate. Okay. I see you printed out some stuff. I got a good one. May I start? You may. Start. I'd like to start on a happy note today. All right. I would like to give you the top 10 <laughs> dog friendliest cities of 2024. Are you a big fan of dogs, Aaron? Open yes. houses? Number one. Number 10. Jacksonville, Florida. But, but hold on. Before you jump into the list, what what determines a uh, dog friendly city? Yeah, we need criteria. Yeah. Thought you would never ask. Weather, walkability, walkability, walkability to the beach, parks, <laughs> parks, dog parks. The amount of renters who have a dog is on the rise. It's up to fifty nine percent compared to forty six percent in twenty nineteen. That makes sense. And COVID when these dogs. pooch parents are looking for their next home, they mean business. Twice as many renters filter for pet friendly listings than for any other amenity on Zillow.com. This is all according to a new analysis by Zillow and Bark, the company behind the dog subscription service, BarkBox. All right, I'm still, and, I'm still curious. What's the all right, criteria, so, the parameters? Um, there's a lot of them, but... <laughs> Just rattle off your... You, you know, give, give us the top here's, three. Here's my list, all right? Number 10, Jacksonville, Florida. Nine, Seattle, Washington. Eight, Phoenix, Arizona. Seven, New York, New York. New York. Six, New Denver, York. Colorado. Indiana, Indianapolis. North Carolina, Charlotte. Texas would be San Antonio. Number two is Austin, Texas. And number one is Dallas, Texas. It's like a lot of hot and places yeah. and cold places. I, I heard that San Jose was on the list, but really? then a UPS driver Ran over a dog. Oh, damn. Dave. And uh, we we lost our ranking. Mm. Damn. That's Dallas truly rolls out the red carpet for its furry, furry legged right. residents. Well, let me, let me earning, ask you a question. Earning the title of the most dog friendly city in the nation. 79% of rental listings proudly proclaim their pet friendly status. Here, the streets are practically ruled by wagging tails and happy barks, especially from golden and Labrador retrievers. If you shout the name Charlie or Bella in a Dallas dog park, he's, he's still going. expect a joyful flurry of fur as these are the top dog names in the pup loving paradise. What was that one thing you told Jeet last week when you're going to tell us? Imagine. <laughs> Jake, cut back to that one. Yeah. Um, okay, so I find it interesting that the top three were all in Texas. Interesting. I am wondering if BarkBox is located in Texas. Interesting. Hey, oh. Jamie, can you check? <laughs> no, it's Jacob. Uh, okay, well, that was a lot of great information, Aaron. But Some real estate stuff. Well, well, I have a question. But, but about, I think at the end of the day, they based it on what percentage of rentals are pet friendly. And, and hold on. Okay. Speaking of rentals and pets mm. isn't there a new law being passed in california where they're taking away the regulation of pets they're now like they're eating the dogs they're eating they're eating the, the cats and dogs um hmm. but yeah isn't a new bill being passed in in our area where there's gonna be no more rental restrictions on animals i haven't heard that yes. um i believe that is coming down the pipe you will still have to pay more pay right? more that deposit, deposit maybe an yeah. increase monthly but i do believe you're correct in that Landlords, God bless California, yeah. can yeah. no yeah. longer say, hey, we don't want pets in our property. Um, I have a client who we closed not too long ago on a single family home, and they did a full redesign for their cat. Love that. They had a cat. Uh, they, <laughs> a little catio? No, they, they had a catio. <laughs> they it had its own bathroom, and, I, and the modifications that they were making. Bathroom? Yeah. yeah. You mean litter, litter box? box. But a room where it, like a little cat yeah, some privacy slides mm -hmm. in. It's like a converted closet. It's got play stuff, a litter box, and a little cat door. Stuff to scratch. Yeah, it's it's a serious. Yeah, a buyer came in this weekend to an open house. Very 
very adamant that the backyard was not big enough for her two dogs. Still said she was going to call me to talk more if she's listening to this. Caitlin, feel free to reach out. Put your number out there for everyone, Ben. I gave her my car. She hasn't you called know, me. But, uh, I mean, pets are part of people's families, right? And so it is something to consider, I think, when you're looking, uh, renting or buying. Well, woof. Yep. Um, you know, <laughs> although I do think. Not called woof box. I do think landlords should be able to charge more if the tenants have kids because kids tear up houses way more than dogs. That's do you think sense. the income level of a renter determines how well they take care of that home? And it could be for the opposite. No. No. no? To a point. Well, yeah, if you're going to pay $10,000 a month for rent, you're probably going to take care of your place. But I, but I also think that... You well, know, I also said it's the opposite, opposite way around. I've seen a lot of $10,000 rentals get just torn down because people's money just gets thrown around and it's not their responsibility. Yeah I, yeah, I definitely think, I mean, some people have more pride of, well, not ownership in this case, but, you know, but pride of, of their, their home, mm-hmm. where they hang their hat. So I don't That's think it cool. matters. I don't think it matters. I think you're going to get people that destroy stuff at on the lower end of the spectrum and the higher. Well... In other news, Fox News has reported that today's interest rates are 6.88 for a 30-year fixed rate, mm-hmm. 6.13 for a 15-year. Rates have shifted a little bit in the last week or so. Up or down? Down slightly. Okay. But um, interesting to see. Bitcoin's at 85000 upon filming this. Um, a lot of people said that they were holding out, waiting for it to get to 100000 So that's kind of interesting. I missed that boat. I've never bought Bitcoin. I don't know that I ever will. I bought just a little bit, so I won't be left out. What about Dogecoin? That is oh, flying yes. right now. Keep going. And a little sh- and Shiba. And Shiba. So, wh- I mean, okay. I am not too big into the, I don't even know what they're called, coins. Crypto. 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 Like, what do you, like, really? What do we do? <laughs> what are you going to do? What do we do with the Dogecoin? <laughs> you have all this Dogecoin. Like, what do you do with it? You sell it. Sell it off. Enough. You call a friend that knows what I, you're doing. That's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, I don't. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> Remember what was it? Two, three years ago with NFTs, mm-hmm. and every, you know everyone, Justin Bieber, Snoop Dogg, everyone's buying all these you know NFTs for a million, two million dollars. Have you seen the values on NFTs? I have not. Are they just tanks? Nothing. I mean, non fungible tokens. What about the fake real estate that was bought in the oh, meta universe? on the blockchain? <laughs> on the blockchain. The metaverse. The metaverse. Right? So what's happened to the real estate values over there? Are they meta? Uh, <laughs> meta? Have you guys have you guys looked at Meta stock? No. It is slowly trickling, 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 trickling up. <laughs> like your mind, like, your mind, your mind just trickling down. All right, so that's what you brought today? Uh, no, my big topic of today is your expectations <laughs> on investment real estate. Whether that is, we basically pre-podcast, we broke it down. We have basically three options. Mine would be, mine is flipping. Jason's is what long-term term investment investing. strategies. Oh, yeah. long-term investing. Long-term yeah. Investing. Specifically out of state. And then what would the other one be? Living in your home and selling it. Yeah. Your term? appreciation your play. Appreciation play. Thank you. I'm Lo- to you're you up there, coach. Your local appreciation play. That's right. So what expectations should somebody have that's like, oh, well, I already own my home. I'd like to get into flipping properties. Well, things that you should consider is how much cash do you have? What does your remodel budget look like? What does the timeline look like? And what do you ultimately want to net out of it? Because as we know, there are several different avenues that people take. Some people want 20, 30% on their money. Other people are totally fine with 10%. And then um, where do you find the properties, right? So like we were talking about like, there's a whole nother world of off market properties. Yeah, we had a couple of people uh, reach out to us and it's like, just very curious. And so um, to provide value to our audience, we thought we'd go down like, where do these things come from? How does it benefit a seller? How does it benefit a buyer? Mm-hmm. And then ultimately, how do you like determine the numbers? So as far as where they come from, we came up with, um, there's only a few options. And this is essentially, if you're interested in this and you want us to help you find um, properties that are like investment grade, this is like what we're doing on the back end to find these things for you. Um, so first and foremost, direct to seller. So we're gonna reach out to sellers directly and say, hey, you know, this is uh, what's going on in your neighborhood. Do you have any interest in selling? And then boom, and then we have the, the seller right then and there. 
Um, the next one is just your on-market MLS deals. Just kind of two things with that. It's um, investment grade properties based on the pictures uh, that first come on the market, like quick. Those ones are, are pretty usually hard to get and are gonna have a lot of competition or there's the, the longer days on market. Uh, we don't see it a ton in our city, but if you're seeing something that's 60, 90 days, it's usually a price issue. And um, hopefully at that point, the seller's gonna be motivated. Uh, the next thing would be reach, reaching out to real estate agents directly. And uh, cause a lot of times, depending on the seller and the situation, the house could be in such disarray where it's a, not really like livable. It's like maybe like a hoarder situation or something like that, um, that, you know, the seller doesn't want to deal with, or the house isn't financeable and they need a cash solution. And so that's, that's kind of where we can provide those things. Um, and then the last one are trusty wholesalers. Now, probably a lot of people don't know what that is, but essentially they're, they're people that get houses under contract at a usually a discount and then they're just selling their interest in the contract to a different buyer so those were the those were the the lead sources where these these opportunities come from what do you think about that uh, i definitely think in a valley like ours where there is limited inventory we have to go above and beyond for our clients to try to find homes that other people can't find for them so everything that jason just mentioned i think is something that we do on a pretty regular basis through our connections with agents, through our wholesale channels, uh, and then obviously the MLS stuff. I, I definitely think there's something to be said for looking at homes that are 60, 90 days on the market, especially if they haven't had a price reduction yet, because you know in that agent's mind, they're like hoping their seller will, you know, will do a price reduction. And that's typically around the time when the seller's thinking like, wow, like we're slower on the market than everybody else. Neighbors' houses are selling, you know, what's wrong with my property? And like you said, it's typically a pricing issue. So I love to be able to go in 30, 45, 60 days uh, from the home, you know, from uh, days on market and be able to negotiate a great price for my clients. And how do we know what a great price is? Mm. Well, we know what a great price is when we look at the acquisition cost plus the remodel and carrying cost and then look at the future value. Boom. Right. So, hey, they want two million for it. We're going to go offer one eight. We can fix it up, get two, three for it. It's going to cost us 200 grand in rehab and caring costs. So after commissions, you know, we'll net a quick two hundred thousand dollars, get in and out in 90 days. Not a bad thing to do. Not mm -hmm. bad. Yeah. And with the uh, the changes um, in California real estate now, when you do these flips, you have to go show permits for to the next future buyers, or what is? No, you just you need, to, you to, just need to disclose. Work. Disclose. Just disclose. And how many days does it have to be in from time of purchase to time of resale? One hundred and eighty. Set it up for a T for you there, Coach. I had no clue. Uh -huh. But yeah, so I you know I, I think obviously in in our market. You know, like I said, those opportunities are fewer and farther between, but certainly being tied into, you know, agents that have done it themselves, right? I, I think that's the important thing, too. I, I think a lot of times, you know, investors will call every agent in the Valley looking for off-market property, but if that agent doesn't even know, you know, what a good opportunity is or not, how can you bring it to an investor? Mm -hmm. And so I think working with a, a team like ours, obviously, that have bought homes, sold homes, flipped homes, built spec homes, built developments, you know, I think we have a pretty well-rounded uh, view on what it takes to make money. So if you didn't go to the market with a house like Poppy mm -hmm. and you stayed off-market, what do you think it would have sold for? Uh, probably 2-2. Two, two. And on market, you got two five. So I think that's the biggest thing as to why some people don't want to buy on market. Uh, mm -hmm. What what value add would it be to a seller to sell off market? Um, value add could be. There's a lot of reasons why sellers choose to sell off market. It could be what we find sometimes is if it's a divorce situation, right, where they don't want the neighborhood knowing what's mm -hmm. going on. They just want to sell the home, get on with it. Uh, other times it could be financial stress. They need cash in a hurry um, and they don't want to spend 30 days to fix it up and prep time and you know, uh, other times if the seller has a number in their head that we can hit, they'll say, hey, here's my take it now number. If you can find me a buyer for this much, I don't need to put it on the market. You know, to your point, we typically advise them you're gonna get more money if you go on the market but some sellers want convenience over top dollar. That's right. That's right. You know, we see that a lot in affluent areas, right? When they're pocket listings, you'll never see a sign in the yard um, and the property will change hands and 
If you hit the number, they'll sell it. We had that one property over in um, kind of near Mount Pleasant High School. Um, owner related to, owner was a sister of the person who passed away in the house. Didn't want anything to do with the house. Didn't oh. want to walk back into the house. Didn't want to put money into the house. Right. Just wanted the dollar she was looking for just to put money into her kids' pockets. I think they wrote an offer on that house. Did, didn't didn't we get David it? David sold that house. Yeah, I, I think my clients got that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh-huh. But to your point, we do see it a lot in trusts mm-hmm. too, right? Where, where somebody passes away and the beneficiaries are like, hey, there's eight beneficiaries. Mm-hmm. An extra 50 grand or 60 grand divided by eight doesn't, you know. You know, we, we want our money now. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to piggyback kind of off of this, um, I've had a few clients reach out. I think I would say this is in the last month. And again, and this goes back to like investment opportunities, um, appreciation opportunities. Um, but the, the question is, how would we go and develop a piece of land if we see something for sale in our neighborhood? And I think as a real estate agent, we look at it in two ways. Obviously, one, what does it take to build upon vacant flat land? Or what does it take to buy a home that needs a full remodel or a teardown? And obviously, when it comes to the permit process and the zoning process, there's many more permits and, and complications that comes with flat land compared to a teardown. But I think what a lot of people don't realize is that if you get a teardown and you leave one wall standing up, you can deem that to the city as a renovated home and not a fully remodel or a full rebuild. rebuild. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you can take us into a little more depth on that, Dave, because no, you're good. You covered okay. it. That'll do it. well i mean we do uh (laughs) fix and flip a lot of properties and there's always a decision to be made right um how to what extent do we remodel do we get permits or do we just go in and do something cosmetic that allows us to get in you know in, in and out pretty quickly and at the end of the day it comes down to roi right you return your investment the amount of time you want to hold the property what the future holds in terms of uh, market volatility, interest rates, you know, there's a lot of variables. Can you share how, if you were to buy a piece of land and mm-hmm. you would have to get a land loan, mm-hmm. how quick does that, or how long does that land loan stay, or do you need to pay for it until you can refinance into your- So there's, there are some lenders still that will just lend on bare land. Most lenders will do a bare land loan and then a construction loan, Mm -hmm. right? So a loan, uh, acquisition loan to acquire the land, and then they wrap it with a construction loan as well. So that that's typically how it's done. Um, Harder and harder to find, and typically now are the rates still the same on those? No, they're more expensive, right? Mm -hmm. Because they're riskier. Uh, And then now most lenders will only do it if you have some sort of history or experience with, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, renovating, doing developments, things like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So plan on putting sixty percent, sixty-five percent down uh, if you need a land loan. And the cost per square foot right now, what is it? Six hundred and fifty, seven hundred dollars a square foot to build. Roughly, roughly. Well, d- yeah, it depends where. I mean, it's flat, s- like it's a flat. Willow Glen. Yeah, yeah, but like six to eight hundred dollars. Yeah, a yeah. foot. I remember, twenty seventeen. It was like four, four hundred fifty. Yeah, literally, I mean, when you guys yeah. flipped Bonnie, what was the price for square foot on that? Sold for or the cost of the remodel. cost of remodel? That was, that, high, that, was, that, that, was high end. that was high end, and that took a long time. That, I mean, that took like a year and a half to to get done. But that was done in like what two thousand twenty. 21? Mm-hmm. Yeah, something like 20. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So probably, what, half or quarter less cost compared to today? I would say so. Yeah. Yeah, so if you're sitting on a lot of Bitcoin and you want to invest in some flips or investment opportunities, please reach out or and we'll take or, care of you. Or if you're sitting on $3 million in Bitcoin, Marvel or DC is now selling uh, the Dark Knight's car. So he can purchase that for $3 million, the full custom tells you a lot about you ben by that comment big bad <laughs> big bad man guy did you watch the penguin on HBO yes Max? one of the best series shows to come out this year it was excellent not gonna lie it was excellent was um, it cartoons no it was uh colin farrell dressed up as the penguin it was actually good more of a gangster series than a super superhero as series. a penguin as the penguin aaron only watches sports he doesn't and that's okay. He doesn't understand. All right. So I'm going to finish with this to wrap up uh, our podcast here. Uh, just want to talk about inventory uh, quickly. You know, we're trending down. It's that time of year. 
And so we're, we got about 40 less units than we did last week. Pendings are off just slightly as well. But now that we've got through October, we're through the election. Um, I think people re- people realize that sky's not falling. You know, it's business as usual. I, if you're a seller, I would seriously cons- uh, consider selling between now and February because you're going to have less competition out there. But, you know, buyer frustration, right? There's people that want to get into the home by the holidays, want to get into a home before the end of the year. So I think there's going to be, you know, we're going to see an uptick in activity. I mean, perfect example, I had a condo on the market for three months with basically no activity and then got two offers on it over the weekend. So I was just going to say, I think right now sellers are very accustomed to just keeping their home on the market for two, three weeks, maybe a month, leaving it at that price point without decreasing that price. And those offers are still coming in. So, and again, this is now to the buyer side. If you're a buyer and you like a home, you're committed on the home, you're committed on the location. Don't be hesitant to put in an offer at value. I understand with days on market, some may think we can get it at a lower cost. Don't be surprised when sellers hold their ground because again, buyers are still out there, like you said, three months later and you got an offer, what, 10K less than what you listed it for three months ago and 10K higher than what you yeah. brought the price down to? Oh, uh, absolutely. All right, let, and, and last, uh, last thing before we wrap up, Mike Tyson, Jake Paul, fighting on Friday on Netflix. Who are you going for? Are you going for Iron Mike at 58 years old? Or are you going for Jake Paul, who's what, 20? You gotta is there, go Iron is Mike. Is there a question? No, I'm I'm asking because I, mean, I, I don't know. Good for Jake Paul, like that's yeah, yeah, yeah. that <laughs> you're doing it, but like no. you're, you're, you're the GOAT, you're Mike Tyson. <laughs> old man muscle. I hope <laughs> old man muscle. Uh, neither of them will get knocked out. Yeah, don't think so, huh? there's all sorts of weird I'm things sh- written in contracts. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure it's not. He's a- 58 years old and had a heart attack on an airplane. Hey, have you guys seen him though? He's, He's looking good. Looking yeah. good. Hey, Mike, looking <laughs> good. I, I wouldn't fight him. That's no, for damn sure. He was actually in Morgan Hill. I think I said this on a podcast. I was with you. Well, right? You saw him, yeah. Saw him walking down the street. When he says we saw him, we heard someone saw him. Whoa, 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 it's better for the story. Yeah, <laughs> someone we were eating. Someone sent us a text. He's, 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 a, he's a very big bird guy. Yes, mm-hmm. pigeons yeah. primarily. Pigeon. He races them. Uh, he's he also yeah, he loves exotic them. birds and tigers and. Hmm. Oh, oh my! Oh my! All right. Great podcast, gentlemen. I've learned a lot. I learned that. Where's the number one city for dogs? Top three are all in Texas. That was right. Yeah. So. Nice. All right. Nice. So Aaron's gonna go put some shoes on. And uh, we're going to get back to work. Let's go. All right.